Welcome to uh, an AIHI, Australian Institute of Health Innovation seminar. And we have a special guest who I'll introduce shortly. Welcome, Phyllis Buto. Um, so this is part of our regular seminar series, but um, today we're joined by a colleague from University of Sydney, Professor Phyllis Buto. She is an SPRF. And if you're an NHMRC sort of person, you'll know that that's a senior principal research fellow with NHMRC. She's also, some of her credentials are here, with the School of Psychology and Chair of Psycho-Oncology Cooperative Research Group at the University of Sydney. Phyllis has got an interesting background. She has a BA with honours, also a Master's of Public Health, uh, a Master's of Clinical Psychology and a PhD. And she's, as I say, got a chair at University of Sydney. For 20 years, she's been working on the doctor-patient relationship, communication, around this idea of psych-oncology, psycho-oncology. What happens to cancer patients um, with, uh, with their well-being when they go such, through such a, a, a pathway in their journey? So this is crucial work for us to understand in the Institute, and we have people from the Institute and colleagues and friends of ours too. Um, but really, Phyllis is a world expert in this area. So it's a privilege to have you here and uh, uh, talk to us. She's gonna talk about strategies for changing the health system, which we're all interested in, even if we're not interested specifically in cancer. But with a specific subtitle after the colon in the talk, implementing a clinical pathway for anxiety and depression in cancer patients. So can you join me in welcoming Professor Phyllis Buto? So I want to start by just quickly acknowledging that the um, program of work I'm going to talk about was funded by the Cancer Institute New South Wales. Um, and there's a large team involved in this work and I'd particularly like to acknowledge Melanie Price and Joanne Shaw from POCOG, the Psycho-Oncology Cooperative Research Group, and Heather Shepherd, who's our program manager, and the consumers and advisors that are working with us on this program. Um, and we have clinical partners with four Cancer Institute New South Wales Translational Cancer Research Centres, which if you haven't heard of them, have been funded by the Cancer Institute over the last few years to focus particularly on translational research and encourage buy-in and engagement of clinical services with this sort of research and champion the work. So just some background. Um, as we've already heard, uh, the experience of a cancer diagnosis is understandably distressing because it raises an existential issue of potential death um, and the treatments that people have to undergo are often very difficult, um, sometimes with long-term side effects and consequences. So it's not surprising that distress is prevalent and that's been shown in a, a very high quality population based study recently in Germany which um, used stratified proportional sampling to make sure that um, the tube, all the different sorts of cancer were appropriately represented in the sample. It recruited over 4,000 patients um, and it included both quantitative assessment via questionnaire <coughs> and a gold standard clinical interview to verify diagnoses. And that study reported a, a four-week prevalence of mental disorder overall of about a third of patients, um, mostly struggling with anxiety, depression and adjustment disorder. So it's a, a very common comorbidity, if you like, in cancer. Now we have very well accepted uh, evidence-based guidelines for psychosocial care of cancer patients in Australia. Um, and we know that we can intervene to improve the outcomes of these patients. So this is a recent meta-analysis of 198 studies involving over 20,000 patients, and they concluded that uh, there were small to medium effects for individual and group psychotherapy and psychoeducation, and larger effects if you restricted the recruitment just to those who were distressed at baseline. And the effects in most studies were sustained in the medium and long term. So because of that evidence base, uh, screening is internationally recommended because we know if we can pick this up and treat it, we can reduce patient suffering, we can decrease their risk of going on to develop a really major mood disorder, we can improve their quality of life, 
Uh, we can improve the, their capacity to adhere to difficult cancer treatments and we can re um, reduce health service utilisation. So there's lots of reasons for addressing this in our health system. But what happens in practice? Well, we did a review uh, a, a year or two ago of screening for distress in cancer patients in Australia and internationally, which was commissioned by Cancer Australia. And we did a review of the literature and we conducted some structured interviews with experts on this area, both internationally and in Australia, um, including a whole range of stakeholders. And what we found was that screening for distress was certainly not routinely conducted in Australia. It tends to occur on an ad hoc and unit specific basis. And it really depends on having a clinical, clinical champion who is interested in this area. And so emotional symptoms are often undetected and their severity is underestimated. So we have a problem. But we also know that just screening for distress is not the answer. And that's well demonstrated by some data from Canada. Canada has really led the way internationally in screening for distress. It's um, in embedded it in policy and practice. And you can see that the number of patients who were screened in Canada um, has steadily increased. But despite this, the data suggests that psychosocial outcomes haven't improved. Now, why would this be the case? Well, in order to be useful, people have to respond to screening data. And US and UK data show that many oncology health professionals don't necessarily value this sort of screening data and they don't respond to it. And so people end up seeing a psychosocial health professional because they've been referred by the bartender and the shoeshine boy as opposed to any health professional. Um, and also synthesis of data from 40 years of screening in the primary care setting shows that screening does not improve patient outcomes unless it is linked to a clear clinical pathway uh, embedding action in response to the screening and institutional commitment. So uh, with that in, in mind, uh, POCOG developed a clinical pathway for anxiety and depression in cancer patients to see if we can um, shift this to a more useful strategy. Uh, we based it on the empirical evidence and also we had wide stakeholder involvement of oncology health professionals around Australia, including a Delphi process with 87 stakeholders. And we did that very carefully because we wanted to ensure engagement with the pathway once it was completed and we wanted to make sure that it was going to be appropriate for all the multidisciplinary health professionals who are involved in the psychosocial care of cancer patients. So our results from the Delphi process really confirm strong support for the clinical pathway, for screening regularly, and for a stepped care model of treatment and review. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But it also emphasised that you need to be flexible in pathway implementation because different services have different resources and different expertise and different patient populations and we need to cater for those. So we developed a pathway which is flexible and can be tailored to each site regarding when patients are screened, the key staff responsible for different aspects of the pathway, the, in, the individual referral networks that each site has and the links um, and links to locally um, developed resources. It incorporates recommendations for uh, when and how to screen, when and how to refer, and how to manage different levels of distress. Um, it suggests timing of follow-up um, after, but uh, both during the patient journey and in survivorship. And it suggests um, optimal roles and responsibilities to carry out the pathway. And it uses this stepped care model with five steps of distress going from minimal to severe anxiety and depression. So that the patient gets the least intensive and least costly intervention that is necessary. And the really more intensive and costly interventions are kept for people who really need it. And it's based on this um, pyramid model um, of psychosocial care where people with severe distress probably need to have intensive face-to-face -face intervention with expert psychosocial health professionals. And people at the bottom probably need standard um, empathic care and information. So this is a, 
um, a schemata of the overall anxiety and depression clinical pathway. I don't expect you to be able to read it. I'm sorry, it's a bit small to fit on one page. But basically what it does is screen through uh, an online questionnaire, um, which can be paper and pencil. It divides people into those who aren't distressed and those who are distressed. Um, if they're distressed, it then requires that a, um, a health professional has a conversation with that patient to really work out whether this is primarily anxiety and depression or in fact is masking another issue such as pain, which should be addressed first. Um, and then a combination of the screening score and that human assessment is used to place the patient into one of those five steps going from minimal to severe anxiety and depression. And then there are different recommendations under each of those steps. And the pathway incorporates re-screening every three months because issues change over time. So we've published a number of the uh, bits of work that went into developing um, the pathway and um, ultimately the pathway itself was published in 2015. But having developed the pathway, we really then had to tackle the question of how can we actually get this into practice so that it can affect patient outcomes. And as you know, implementation and of health service change is difficult to achieve and many evidence-based uh, interventions never come off the shelf and they're not successfully implemented. And even if you can get them in, it's even more difficult to have them be sustainable. Um, if you try to implement and don't succeed, that has consequences. Um, it, makes, uh, it adds burden to the staff who are trying to implement this on top of their usual um, clinical responsibilities. Um, it can reduce the quality of patient care while, while the initial havoc is occurring. Uh, it can disrupt workflow, increase staff stress levels, and ultimately make staff less willing to try the next um, alternative or the next health service change. So we really want to work hard to make sure that when we do attempt to implement um, health service changes, we succeed. So that's where implementation science comes in. And if you look at the hierarchy of research, we're very good at descriptive and efficacy and effectiveness studies. But as a, as a community, we're not nearly as good at conducting research to identify what the barriers and facilitators might be to implementing change in health services and how you can successfully implement and ensure sustainability of interventions. So that top right hand um, side of the slide is something that really needs development. And there is a, a serious lack of work in this area. So there was a systematic review in 2014 which uh, noted that less than 6% of all the studies, medical and health studies conducted, aim to close the gap between evidence and clinical practice. So we're not doing much work in this area. So this is where uh, our current body of work comes in, uh, funded by a, a Cancer Institute New South Wales Translational Program grant. We really wanted to get our pathway into clinical practice, but we also wanted to develop and evaluate the best way to get this implemented successfully and be sustainable. And we really were asking the question, what degree of support, what strategies are needed, and what degree of support and training and cost is required to enable uptake. Now, I'll talk more about that primary study a little later, but we started this work by doing a systematic review with one of our PhD students attached to this program, Lisbeth Gehligs, and we wanted to know what is in the literature already about barriers and facilitators to hospital-based implementation and what factors and strategies are associated with implementation success so that we could guide our program. So uh, Lisbeth looked at quantitative and qualitative studies um, conducted in hospital settings um, by hospital staff um, to put in place interventions which had a patient focused outcome. And the study had to contain formal data um, pertaining to the barriers and facilitators to implementation, lessons learned. So having looked through the normal databases and going through the normal processes of getting rid of duplicates and inappropriate uh, papers, she ended up with 38 papers. Um, and when we uh, synthesised the results, 
um, basically we concluded that there were three key areas, each with four sub-factors, incorporating issues to do with the system, staff and the intervention itself. And I'll just go through each of those uh, quickly in turn. So in terms of the system, um, there were issues around workload. So uh, if, if staff had a heavy workload and little time, if there was a high staff turnover or shift work, it made it difficult to deliver an intervention consistently and you had to train and retrain staff constantly to, to keep up the skills required for the intervention. If you didn't have physical space that was required for the intervention, that could also be a problem. So for example, if you needed a confidential quiet space in which to have a, an assessment of anxiety and depression and you there was no such space available, then you were going to face problems. If the uh, intervention involved some sort of innovative IT um, and the uh, site didn't have that capability or the expertise, that was going to cause problems. If there were workflow processes and movement of patients and staff which did not match what was required from the intervention, that would give you problems. And if staff were trying to introduce too many things at once where they were really trying to juggle priorities and weren't sure which they should be focusing on, which is often a problem in research, that was also an issue. Um, and one quote from the studies that we looked at said, it's not always easy, depending on the staffing levels. Obviously, if you've got a lot of sick or, uh, or on, on annual leave or whatever, the numbers are short, it's not always possible. And those are real world issues in the environment. Um, there were also cultural issues in the system uh, in terms of how ready the, uh, the whole organisation was to adopt a change model and their belief and motivation to um, adopt this and take it on board. Communication processes also came up. Um, if you didn't have good trust between colleagues or between clinical staff and the research staff, um, then it made it difficult to really work. And if the culture of communication with the institution tended to be rather closed and people didn't talk about problems, then it was also more difficult. And then there were external factors. So if you had standards and guidelines and policy that supported the intervention, um, then it made it much uh, easier. And so the quote says, we wrote the policy to be a mandatory directive so that those people at the ground level had the top-down support to be able to say, we have been told we have to do this. And that can be from a state perspective, a national perspective or an institutional perspective. So what about staff um, and the issues that we have to consider there? Well, um, individual staff's commitment and motivation make all the difference. So if you've got staff who really believe in the intervention, they can overcome all sorts of barriers. Um, the degree to which they feel that the intervention is valid and needed in their particular setting, uh, and their sense of ownership over this intervention rather than feeling that it's being foisted upon them and a belief that they, they are capable of making the change and their colleagues are capable of making that change um, all make a difference. Um, staff understanding and awareness is also important because if they don't understand the goals of the intervention, you can have uh, unnecessary resistance. Um, and if they don't understand the processes and mechanics of the intervention, then they won't be able to carry it out effectively. Um, and role identity can also be important. So having individual staff who are willing to take on new tasks and um, see their role flexibly can really help. And if everybody understands whose role is, what, what is whose role. So in this quote, the nurse says, there is a lack of clarity about whose role it is, who the decision maker is. It's not that uncommon that someone says, well, that's my role. And everyone in the rest of the team goes, is it? Um, staff skills, ability and confidence is also critical, so to carry their, their confidence that they can carry out the intervention, that they can manage the stress and competing priorities and that they can engage with patients and overcome barriers is um, really important. So one of the people in our own qualitative studies said, I felt that if I disturbed something while I was talking to them, I, didn't have, I don't have the psychological backup for them and I don't have the capacity to cope if somebody breaks down in tears. So that would be a, a major barrier. Um, but there were also barriers uh, in the intervention itself. 
So the more complex the design and the components of the intervention, the harder it is to get in. Um, the more cost and more resources required, the more difficult it will be. Um, if it's not flexible to the individual site's needs, it's going to be difficult and it needs to be fit for context. So uh, it needs to fit that, that particular site requirements. Um, the intervention needs to be believable and to have a strong evidence base so that people can have faith in it. Um, if patients or staff feel that it's not safe or there could be medical legal concerns, um, that can be a problem. So in this quote, the person says, I don't like it. I don't like having my name attached to it. By giving it to the patient, I'm endorsing its content completely and that makes me feel uncomfortable. I suspect it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Now that wasn't our anxiety and depression pathway, I should hasten to add, but it is a problem if you have an intervention where people don't feel safe. Um, and the degree of support that you provide in putting the intervention to place is important. The education and training you provide, the marketing and awareness campaigns that you run about the intervention, whether staff get audit and feedback so they know where they're going right and where they're going wrong, um, and involving the end users in how the whole thing is delivered. Um, so it's very important to um, uh, be able to provide them with the support that they need to carry out this intervention adequately. And of course there are relationships between all of those, so if the system doesn't support staff then it makes it, uh, that those staff factors even more critical. But if you've got really motivated staff they could overcome system barriers and you can design your intervention to overcome some of the system barriers. So it really demonstrates the importance of thinking about all those three things, the system, the uh, staff and the intervention itself in designing something that's actually going to work. And being able to be flexible and learn as you go is also critical. And I'm probably speaking to the converted here, but in any case, this is what we've learned. Um, so pre-implementation assessment of the system fa um, factors is useful and you can do that with formal validated measures or qualitative strategies and there's some great uh, tools out there to assess system readiness for change and the issues that are likely to come up. Assessment of staff engagement and beliefs um, can really guide you in developing strategies that are going to target those issues um, before they become a barrier such as involving um, those staff in the intervention development, um, giving targeted education and training that's suited for each group of staff, um, integrating ongoing feedback from staff about how they're finding the intervention and providing them with um, a really good forum where they can discuss those concerns and get them addressed. And then the in intervention implications are that they really need to be flexible and to engage with the needs of the end users. So we really need to think about what we're trying to do with an intervention, how we're trying to design it, and what in the real world is going to affect its implementation that might guide us towards adjusting our initial ideas. And it's, uh, these sorts of uh, thoughts are, are not dissimilar to some of the implementation frameworks that are already out there that are um, often used to guide implementation strategies like the PERI framework but we felt that we, we got some more nitty gritty um, and useful ideas out of that systematic review. So how did we use all this in our own work to try and get this anxiety and depression pathway into practice? Well, we started with a pre-implementation barriers analysis where we talked to end users. And what they told us was that it was going to be difficult to put this uh, pathway into practice because they didn't have time, they were already as busy as they could be. Um, there wasn't enough resources and the facilities weren't, weren't necessarily there. Um, there was no agreement on the screening tool um, to be used across different institutions and what cutoff scores to trigger different um, steps of the pathway. And they were also worried about who was going to do this extra work, who was going to be responsible for screening, assessing and referring. Um, and they felt an ethical responsibility that if they did launch the program, found people who were anxious and depressed and then didn't feel that they had adequate staff to refer them to, that, that they would be leaving those people unhelped. 
On the other hand, they said, if you can engage with us, engage particularly with the psychosocial services and the nursing staff, um, that was really important because at the end of the day, they're going to implement it. And they felt that uh, the more we could convince um, the staff that there was a strong evidence base that this was actually going to make their life easier and outcomes for patients better, then we would increase motivation. Um, they also raised patient barriers, particularly the stigma of mental health care, which is still present, where people feel uncomfortable acknowledging that they're struggling and accepting mental health care. They feel embarrassed that they're not coping. They don't want to burden their cancer care team, who they already regard as saving their lives. And they feel they're not bad enough to warrant care. They've got enough support and um, really, it, you know, they, they don't want to take up mental health care. And as this person said, for a lot of people, it'll be the first time they've ever spoken to someone about distress. So actually, it's not a simple thing to even ask. And so we might be ready to provide uh, our psychosocial care, but we may not have any customers. Uh, however, they felt that patient resources, um, which might normalise psychological morbidity in care, would help. Um, and certainly, um, if we can, could support the staff in knowing how to talk about anxiety and depression and make an effective referral to overcome that sort of stigma, then that would help. Um, in terms of system barriers and solutions, um, our uh, interviewees also talked about the need for explicit support from the institution, that spending on um, time on these issues is well spent, that it's valued and supported, and that um, we're given time to do it, and that it's a priority. So we needed to get uh, high-level support for the intervention, um, even at the, um, preferably at the state level, but at least at the local level. So how did we, having learnt that, uh, we set about to systematically address those barriers uh, before we launched into the implementation. So in terms of the need for higher level support, we um, appointed clinical and administrative champions at each of our sites to work with us um, uh, to really support the intervention. And we also had uh, the uh, Translational Cancer Research Centres and Cancer Institute New South Wales backing to provide a, a bit more of a remote um, push. In terms of the um, general oncology staff who we really wanted to own this intervention, we involved key staff from all disciplines, both in developing the pathway initially, but also then in tailoring it to their site when we got there to, do, to implement. In terms of lack of education, um, we decided to develop some online educational resources to provide training to staff on how to open a discussion about anxiety and depression, um, how to refer um, and how to make a referral, particularly if a patient was initially reluctant. And we made that available on the major oncology um, education um, platform, EVIQ, in New South Wales. In terms of the general oncology staff who were worried about lack of time, we, we uh, have created a, uh, an automated online system to make as much as we could um, automatic um, enrolling out this pathway. So the automated system, once a patient is entered, sends an email to patients queuing them to fill in online questionnaires. Their scores are automatically um, added uh, if they get over the cutoff, the system automatically sends an email to the nominated triage person. Um, it provides a graph of scores over time so that staff can and patients can um, track their progress. Uh, it has referral templates that, patient, that staff can click on to make the referral process easier and it enables them to automatically email those referrals to the nominated referral network. And it, cues patients to re-screen at regular intervals. So as much as we could, we wanted to make this easy. Um, the psychosocial staff were worried that they would be um, overburdened with thousands of patients that we would be, be discovering um, who were anxious and depressed. So to tackle that barrier, we've developed online cognitive behavioural therapy targeted, tailored to uh, cancer 
um, so that people with mild to moderate anxiety and depression could potentially get their care online and leave the psychosocial staff to deal with the more severe cases. In fact, more appropriate referral actually. Um, and in terms of patient stigma and reluctance to burden staff, um, we've developed written and online resources to explain what anxiety and depression is, to normalise it, um, to note that it's part of routine care and to give them an idea of what would be likely to happen as, as part of the pathway in their screening and management of that issue. And we train staff to screen and refer well. So we were very careful to um, develop those resources, the online portal, the patient resources, the health professional resources and online cognitive behaviour therapy, which we hoped would get over those barriers and make this a success. We then launched a whole range of pilot studies of all of those resources, which were, are just coming to an end. So we've done some randomised controlled trials, some pre-post studies and some qualitative studies um, to be confident that um, the resources we've developed are effective. So um, I thought I would just give you a bit of a, uh, an overview of what those resources look like before talking about the main study that we're doing. I'm, I'm going all right for time. So the online portal is basically a management system. Um, it uses validated online screening questionnaires and we recommend um, two, um, the Distress Thermometer and the ESAS um, questionnaire, which patients are prompted to complete every three months. Um, as I've said, it alerts staff when somebody is in need of, uh, an, in, of a, a conversation to determine whether or not they need help. And there's evidence-based step care management recommendations and referral templates, and that's all on the portal. There's a um, huge logic map, map behind the... Um, don't bother trying to decode this one either. There's a huge logic map that underlies the um, portal, if then, then, then that. Um, and we had numerous meetings to work out how we would make sure that nobody fell through the holes. So there are prompts if people don't complete, there are prompts if staff don't do what they're meant to. Um, there's all sorts of automated processes in the portal. Um, basically people can, both health professionals and patients can log into the system um, and then they're um, sent to a dashboard which is a, an easy to use click on system where they can click on uh, actions required and if something is required of them there'll be a there'll be a sign up there uh, they can click on to get uh, reports of their patients um, and of the um, site overall um, the link to the education resources is on the health professional page and the link to the online therapy is also on the health professional page similarly the patients get onto a portal like this with actions required such as completing questionnaires um, they can um, get help and support. There's links to local and um, also uh, more rec other widely recommended resources and the online therapy is also on their dashboard. We've piloted this whole system at one major oncology service. We tailored it to their, their requirements. We trained them in using the portal. It went live for three months and we've recorded the number of patients registered and screened and referred and who used the online therapy um, and the amount of data entered and that's been really helpful and we've made a few tweaks as a result of that but largely the system worked and our interviews with staff afterwards um, have been positive. So in terms of the patient resources, we developed um, online and um, PDF and printable resources um, that uh, can link them to other resources as well. Um, that was based on a review of existing resources because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and we've developed web content about what are anxiety and depression screening and referral. Um, and in uh, our evaluation of those resources, patients have viewed them very positively. The health professional education um, involved the development of five modules. The first, uh, it incorporates um, expert clinician delivery of education so that it's believable and um, has face validity. Um, We've got downloadable resources and tip sheets and uh, a manual for how it can be used in formal training. Um, 
we did again a literature review of the communication um, literature and the guidelines that we have on um, education and support. And we used a, a theoretically derived model of health professional education and adult learning principles. So the modules cover what is anxiety and depression and what are the risk factors for anxiety and depression, um, how screening might work, what the measures um, that are likely to be used and what the cutoffs mean, um, and how that then relates into the step care model of care. Um, the third module covers how to initiate a conversation about anxiety and depression, um, how to evaluate whether someone's at risk if they've got very high anxiety and depression and might need um, acute care, um, how to educate patients about anxiety and depression and discuss the next steps. Um, the fourth module um, is about how to initiate a referral if the um, conclusion is that the patient does need some support, um, how to explain what services are available, um, including the online psychological therapy, and how to make a referral. And then the fifth module covers uh, how to manage more difficult conversations. Um, if the patient is at first uncomfortable with that, um, of course, it's the patient's right to refuse a referral. Um, but if they have concerns that can be overcome, that might um, be helpful. And again, the modules have been um, evaluated positively. So finally, the online um, cognitive behaviour therapy is the first one that's been developed in the world. There's been a lot of uh, online therapy for anxiety and depression which has been evaluated in the general population, but there has not been anything specifically for cancer patients previously. So we worked with a group at CRUFAD, um, which is a psychiatry group specialising in anxiety and depression at the University of New South Wales, who had done a lot of work in this area in the general population. Um, they've done numerous RCTs to evaluate their work in the general population. Um, but so we worked with them to tailor what they'd done to the cancer context. And we developed separate programs for early stage and advanced cancer because they really uh, do have different issues. With advanced cancer, they're facing an incurable diagnosis. Whereas with early stage cancer, of course, it's potentially curable. Um, this is some of the work um, that summarises the evidence base um, for this online approach, and there's a very good evidence base. Um, and basically the um, intervention comprises lessons which uses a comic style um, approach to ensure that even people with low health literacy can access it effectively. Um, it teaches skills and strategies and it has two characters that um, are followed through all the lessons that model use of the skills and strategies, model having ups and downs. Um, and we hope that people can relate to those characters. Um, there are also written summaries of the lessons and homework with exercises and um, some extra resources that people can link into. So the sort of cartoon format looks like this. Um, this is an example of someone uh, using one of the interactive exercises um, and having some ups and downs. There are eight lessons that um, go through different um, issues that are common to most cognitive behaviour therapies. Um, and we've nearly completed an RCT of the early stage version and um, we're underway with a pre-post study of the advanced version and the results are looking promising. So, um, having developed all those resources, the next three years are going to be spent um, applying them in uh, a large cluster randomised controlled trial. Um, the, the aim of the clustered randomised trial is to uh, fundamentally evaluate the implementation strategies we're using to get this pathway into clinical practice. We're not aiming to prove that you can reduce anxiety and depression because that work's already been done. What we're aiming to prove is that we can get a clinical pathway into practice. Um, so the unit of the analysis is not the patient, but the site. Um, and we're recruiting 12 oncology sites around New South Wales. Um, they can be whole service sites or uh, individual tumour streams, such as the breast cancer service, or a treatment modality such as the medical oncology service because each unit and, um, is organised differently. And they're randomised to a core 
versus enhanced implementation strategy um, stratified by urban versus regional, regional, uh, rural, regional, uh, because we want to make sure that this pathway is useful both in large well-resourced centres as well as smaller, less resourced centres. Um, and so the key question is, do you need to spend the money and the time uh, to provide a, a really gold standard approach to implementation or can you get away with a lesser implementation approach? So all sites have access to all of those resources that I've just been talking about. Um, they get on site training in how to use, on, on the pathway itself and how to use the portal and the other systems. Um, there are posters advertising the program um, used throughout and they have access, they can all access reports and feedback. But in the enhanced arm, we have intensified proactive support from the research team uh, where we proactively provide them with reports and we proactively generate meetings um, and contacts um, and, fe and feedback and adjustments. So. Um, we hope that the pathway really will be successful in both sites, but we're interested in whether it really needs that more intensive approach. So the primary outcome of the trial is adherence to the anxiety and depression pathway in that site. So the proportion of patients who receive the appropriate steps of the pathway within each site. The secondary outcomes are the acceptability, the adoption, the appropriateness, the feasibility, the fidelity, penetration and sustainability of the um, intervention. So do staff accept this? Do they, do they adopt it? Um, do they think it's appropriate to their site? Do they deliver it in the way that we ask them to do, do it? Um, does it really penetrate through the whole system or are only three patients screened? Um, and is it sustainable? Will it continue to be used at the end of the trial? We're also looking at the costs of the resources and the implementation strategies. We are, of course, recording and will have access to the anxiety and depression data collected on, we hope, thousands of patients during the trial. Uh, we want to look at um, how successfully patients are triaged and the referral um, activity that goes on. So this is, again, a rather a complicated slide, but basically the program is going through three phases. And the first phase, if you can sort of go like this, is the recruitment phase where uh, we're identifying appropriate sites um, and, and doing some initial engagement with them um, and then enrolling them officially into the clustered randomised control trial. So that has already occurred. In the pre-implementation phase, we then spend three to six months uh, getting baseline data from them. Um, collecting information about what resources their patients are currently um, using through MBS and PBS data, um, the referral patterns to psycho-oncology services that are occurring currently, who is being screened, if anybody. Um, we're doing a staff survey to identify system readiness and staff attitudes. Uh, we're, brief, we're also doing a brief workflow assessment to make sure that we tailor the pathway appropriately to that site. Um, and doing key staff interviews to help us um, with that process as well. The next phase is the actual implementation phase, starting with eight structured engagement meetings where we tailor the, t we finally then tailor the pathway to their site um, and get them going, give them the training that they need um, and um, get them going. And then we're collecting, it goes live for a year and we're collecting some data midway through that year and at the end of the year um, to look at how to partly give um, audit and feedback and also partly at the, end, at the end, of course, to collect our outcome data. So you can see it's a huge program of work and without the excellent staff that I showed you at the beginning, we would not be succeeding, but actually we're on time and on target at the moment. So that is the end and I would invite questions. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the email report comes with a flag um, which includes the, reflects the step. So if the higher the anxiety and depression, the redder the flag. Um, so 
the staff member is really cued as to how urgent this is. It goes to the person who, within the tailoring for that site, is nominated as the triage person responsible. So we get, um, that can be more than one person, um, but is usually only one or a few and there's usually a manager who's also um, responsible for that flow of work, but it, it is all determined in the tailoring period. Um, actually, they were pleasantly surprised um, because, of course, only about uh, 10 to 15% of patients will have anxiety and depression, so the majority of screens will be negative. Um, and we also, um, as part of our engagement with sites, really try to reassure them that because of the automation and because so many of those patients can then go on to the online therapy or to other um, sorts of resources, and because we work with them to clarify their referral network, which they probably have never done before, um, during the engagement process, the workflow actually ends up being um, less than you would, you, you would think. Um, and, and in fact, that was the experience in the pilot. The evidence from CRUFAD is that older people are getting more and more computer savvy, <laughs> partly because we're all getting older and we're computer savvy. Um, and the, um, the uh, saturation of households with computers is just going up and up and up. Um, so, but there always will be people who will not engage with a, a computer. So in those, uh, it is a discussion between the patient and the referrer as to what will be appropriate for them. Um, and of course, if they choose not to engage with that, um, then um, they won't. There is some clinical overview of the online intervention. So the online intervention uh, assesses people as they go each week. Um, and if their score doesn't go down, then an automatic message goes back to the treatment team that this person is not responding well to the online therapy and may need to have an alternative approach. So that's part of our safety uh, procedures, um, which are already part of what CRUFAD does, but we've built, built it into the, to this as well. So yes, we expect that some sites will differ um, and we are interested in who accesses it and who doesn't and who stays in it and who doesn't stay in it. But the evidence from the general population is that it's pretty well taken up and is simply enough presented that most people can interact with it effectively. Absolutely, and, and that is the core topic for Lisbeth in her PhD. Right. So she's really looking at the, modifi you know, the modifiers and mediators of success yes. in, in our 12 sites through a mixture of qualitative and quantitative sorts of strategies. I guess um, certainly there, uh, as I said at the, at the beginning, there are sites doing some screening, really relies on champions. Um, so. Uh, working with the sites to identify a core team that we can imbue with enthusiasm and, and really get on side with this um, is clearly going to be critical. So we know that the champions are critical. Um, it, it, uh, there are, I think, the staff, individual staff issues and enthusiasm and the degree to which they feel supported by the top is going to be important. So we've, we've tried to build those in, but we will be looking at that through the um, trial. So in terms of different populations, we, we know from bitter experience that women with breast cancer <laughs> are the most um, avid users of anything that we offer. Um, and that's partly because they're women, I think, um, and partly because, you know, breast cancer is such a familiar um, and media-friendly cancer. Um, so we're expecting that we may well get more women with breast cancer in the study, but we'll, we're certainly, um, 
we, we certainly designed the online therapy, for example, to include male models and to include people from different ethnic backgrounds and to include people with different sorts of cancer. So we, we are certainly trying to model that this can be useful to anybody, but, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, what was the second question again? It was... Adherence. Oh, adherence, yes. So um, in terms of... We, we can um, follow in uh, how many of the lessons, for example, people go through on the online therapy. Um, there is a template that we prompt for for from um, any of the psychosocial staff who are offering therapy to patients <coughs> to complete when they... Um, com so if the patient drops out, they tell us. Um, and they um, also report back into the portal when the person's finished. Um, we also, of course, re-screen those patients sometime later, so we're able to track whether they've improved or not as a result of that therapy. So we are um, keeping track of engagement of, of patients through the system very carefully. And our intent in asking the core question um, around implementation, I mean, it, there, there may be features that are specific to mental health, yeah. but I would hope and think that what we discover will be relevant to any clinical pathway, and that is part of the goals of the underlying yeah. program of work. And there are lots of other pathways that are, that are starting to be, uh, within, within cancer, which is my area of expertise, for example, there's a pain pathway that's yeah. currently being evaluated. There are a number of other pathways. And the Cancer Institute New South Wales is working towards a sort of integrated system where we assess for a range of symptoms and then have the appropriate pathways behind them. So I think eventually we will get there and we hope that this work will contribute to it. Thank you very much.